all our sin. Uh, I want to thank the man of God, Pastor Hay, for uh, inviting me to just uh, occupy the capacity of the speaker of the day uh, to grace us with a word from God. I am always honored to serve and uh, I'm always honored when I am able to speak to uh, those of you who are joining us on this fantastic, fabulous Sabbath day. Uh, I want you to help me preach this sermon today. So right now you do have license, you do have permission from me to uh, take yourself off Zoom and uh, give God a praise, you know, give God a shout uh, and let him know that you are happy and overjoyed that safely through another week he has brought you on your way. And so you are here to give him the praise that he deserved. God is good family. And so we are grateful for what he has done. Uh, I, I won't be long with you today. I, I will be rather short. So I'm going to do my best to try and get through this sermon in the next uh, 15 or so minutes. Uh, the scripture, which was beautifully read, I won't reread it, but I want to talk to you under the topic uh, this afternoon, the end of your beginning, the end of your beginning. Father in heaven, all morning we've been speaking, but God, it's, your now, it's now your time to speak. Father, I pray that you will give us a word from on high even now, Father. Use me as you please. Uh, hide me behind the cross, God. Let me not be seen, but you be seen. Let me not be heard, dear Father, but you be heard. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Uh, the end of your beginning. Today is a fabulous day, and I'll tell you why. Online worshiping with us is my mother. Uh, uh, she, she is going to hear me speak for another time. She has been uh, truly overjoyed for this thing called Zoom because now she don't even go to the church building anymore. She just go on Zoom wherever I'm preaching on a given Sabbath. So uh, I, I want to just say my mom is on, and I'm happy to be I'm happy to be, uh, at, I'm happy to have her presence uh, gracing us on this blessed Sabbath day. Um, let's get into the word, family. Let's get into the word. I, I, I'm never, I, I'm pretty sure, or maybe not, uh, uh, you've heard the statement before. It doesn't really matter uh, how you start, but it matters how you finish. Uh, I've heard this saying a lot of times, but um, I don't know all about that really, because if you were to ask me, I would tell you it depends on who you ask. Uh, don't judge the preacher, but uh, there are times when I wish I was born rich. Mm, I, I know I have some testimony on this prayer line. You know, I, I know maybe if I ask Sister Bailey right now, Sister Bailey, do you wish you were born rich? Maybe Sister Bailey would say, of course, uh, preacher, I, I wish I was born rich. Um, I, 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 but the thing about it is you, you, you have people, however, uh, who are born rich today uh, because uh, of their beginnings, uh, they turned out to be drug addicts. Uh, uh, because of their beginnings, you still have people who have uh, self-esteem issues today. They were born with everything, what you'd call gold spoon in their mouth, but they, they turned out to be something else. I, I, what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters, is that sometimes how you start may not necessarily be how you finish. <laughs> Uh, you, you, sometimes you know, there are people who grew up very humbly. Uh, I thank God for my humble beginnings. I, I, I am what you call a representation of humble beginnings, uh, eating out of one plate kind of thing, uh, sharing the bed with uh, brothers and siblings. Uh, you know, I, I'm what you call a humble beginning. And I appreciate my humble beginning. Why? Because who I am today and what I am today is because of how I started. Hello, somebody. Uh, who you are today has a lot to do with how life greeted you when you entered this world. I don't need to beat around the bushes. I'm just trying to say your beginnings are important because it dictates where you go, what you do, 
and who you become. You see, the preceding verses of Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and verse 2 particularly, it gives us an idea of where Saul was before he became Paul. You see, mentally, it gives us an idea where he wanted to go. It gives us an idea of what he was going to do and what he wanted to do. You see, Paul's beginning has a lot to do with where he was at this point. He was born a Jewish, he was born to Jewish parents uh, with Roman citizenship. He studied under the great Pharisaic instructor Gamaliel. Under his tutelage, Paul became an expert in Hebrew scriptures, making him well-versed in the Old Testament history and the laws. Paul had what you'd call an Ivy League educational upbringing because he learned from the best, but his degree was pharisaically skewed, brothers and sisters. His degree was pharisaically skewed. If you, if you would just pull from your scriptures recollection box real quick, you will understand and you will remember that the Pharisees had a problem with Jesus. You remember that they had a problem with him because he didn't really live according to their ways. <laughs> In contrast to the two commands of Christ, which is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And then you should love the others, you know, other people like you'd love yourself. To this basic and simple command, the Pharisees had developed a system of 600 and 13 laws, 365 negative commands, and 248 positive laws. So by the time Christ came, the Pharisees had produced a heartless, cold, and arrogant brand of righteousness, and they had a problem with Jesus because Jesus did and lived a life in opposition to their law. So in essence, what I'm trying to tell you is that Paul grew up thinking that he needed to hate Jesus. Mm. Paul grew up thinking he was taught from his instructors, from his Ivy League educational system, he was taught that he needed to hate Jesus Christ. And anybody that followed him, it was the great Mandela who said, no one is born with hate. Uh, therefore, hatred is taught. And so the Bible says he sets out on this mission to capture any, by any means, the followers of Christ. And because he's a man of the law, he made sure he got his search and arrest warrant. He wasn't going to go anywhere and do anything unless he has his search and arrest warrant. So he went to his dignitaries friends and he said, listen, man, I got a plan. I got a plan to eradicate this world from all of those people who are worshiping Jesus. I got a plan to go and search them out, find them wherever they are, and bring them to justice. But little did Paul know that man may plan his way, but God is the God who determines his steps. Little did Paul know that while he had a zeal to capture the people of God, to enslave and imprison them, God had a plan to capture his heart. Hello. I'm talking to somebody. Uh, God had a plan to capture his heart. Uh, the problem with Paul was that he needed a change of perspective. He needed a realignment of purpose. He needed an end to his current beginning. His theological factory settings were overriding his spiritual experiential codifications, and Paul needed a reset. Uh, uh, he needed a change in ideas. He needed a change of perspective. And who else but Jesus can make us whole again? Who else but Jesus can make us a new creation and a brand new man where all things are passed away? Who else but Jesus that can pick us up and turn us around and plant our feet on solid ground? Who else but Jesus can see us sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore, very deep and stained within, sinking to rise no more? Who else can hear or earn? His cry and from the depths of sin lifts us up. Nobody but Jesus. The Bible says, beloved, as he was on his way to Damascus, God pressed 
what we can call the reset button and shut him down. <laughs> can I tell you something? There's this thing they call smartphone in 2021. I don't know if any of you guys own a smartphone or if you own the flip phone or whatever phone you own, uh, but there's this thing called a smartphone in 2021. And as smart as these phones are, brothers and sisters, there are times when they act like they're not smart at all. I, I wish I had a witness. <laughs> there are times when the smartphones act like it's not smart at all. <laughs> and then you got to go in the smartphone into this place called settings. <laughs> and when you go into settings, you got to go to the other place called reset. <laughs> Why? Because there's something going on in the smartphone that's making the smartphone act dumb. <laughs> and you got to go into that smartphone and press the reset button. <laughs> and when you press the reset button, <laughs> the smartphone smartphone shuts down and restarts again. What I'm trying to tell somebody that on this line this morning is that maybe you're at a point in your life where you're acting a way that you shouldn't be acting, where you're acting contrary to the will of God. I'm here to tell you that God will press that reset button. Uh, he pressed that reset button for Paul and he shut him down. He shut him down and struck him with a physical blindness that represented his spiritual blindness. And God said something rather interesting. He asked Paul, he said, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to be kicking against the pricks. You see the saying, the saying, the saying kicking against the pricks was developed from a practice where farmers would raise or would use sharp edge sticks known as goads to kind of guide their animals a along a certain path. And so like any normal animal beings, you know, like any normal animals, at certain point you get frustrated because you want to go a certain place. You look at a certain place and you see some green grass, you want to go and graze, but you can't go there because you have these sharp sticks uh, hindering you. The animals would get frustrated and they would kick against these pricks, but only to realize that the pricks ain't feel nothing. Each time they would kick against these pricks, they would only be damaging them own selves. So what Paul, what God was saying to Paul here is that God was saying to him, I've been knocking on your heart door for some time now, Paul. I've been trying to realign you. I've been trying to give you a different perspective. I've been trying to put you on a different path. I've tried through Stephen. I've tried through many aspects. I've tried to even Jesus himself, but you still haven't gotten it. Why are you kicking against the pricks, Paul? Only hurting yourself. Only causing yourself pain. I've been trying, Paul to put an end to your current beginning. I wanted to always give you a new start, Paul, a new fresh mindset, a new idea, a new look at life. Here it is, church. God has been knocking on your heart's doors. Just as he has been asked, knocking on Paul's, some of us have been refusing him for years. We've been kicking against the pricks refusing to let him in. But when God gets ready, when God gets ready to press that reset button, you've got to move. You see, the reset button is never like the first option because God, God is he, he, he's long suffering. He's merciful. He, 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 he's the type of God that will work with you and try and try to work with you and get to you to understand that there's change that is required. There's a change that is needed. But there's a time when God says, you know what? I can work no more. I'm just going to hit that reset. But, you know, I don't know if you know, uh, but, you know, back in the Caribbean, brothers and sisters, there are times when the fridge start to behave a certain way. Uh, and there are times when the TV start to behave a certain way. It won't turn on. It won't work. Uh, back in the Caribbean, all, you know, you know, licking things was the best way to fix things. And so when things won't work, you just give it a few slaps. <laughs> and then, you know, it begins to work miraculously or something. Maybe it was a shorts or whatever it was. But uh, granted, every time the TV or the radio 
oil wouldn't work. All you got to do is rough it up. <laughs> All you got to do is give it some slaps and it would work. Uh, but there are times when God will literally have to literally slap you up <laughs> in order to get your attention. God will work with you and he will try his best to get your attention. But when God really wants to save you, he will try and he will try, but there are times when he's gonna blow out your candles. <laughs> Because in order to heal you, he's got to bruise you. In order to refine you, he's got to burn you. Somebody needs to thank God for the reset option. You see, the reset option is the option that says, God, I've been running away all this time, trying to stay on the same level that I've been on for years, but you're trying to bring me to a new level. And I'm not working in favor with your plan. I'm not working in line with your plan, but God wants to change us and we're not working in accordance with his plan. God is saying, I'm going to press the reset button and shut you down so you can start again. <laughs> hey, I'm going to shut you down so you can start again. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You see, this reset option is not a new concept. This reset option is not a new concept. The first reset or the best reset option is the option known as Jesus Christ. In fact, his life on earth was mission reset. He died on Calvary and reset the price of salvation for you and me, made it free of cost. So today we can have all life and have it more abundantly. We can have an experience that we've never had before. He can make us new. <laughs> because of this reset option, the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, sinners plunged beneath this flood can lose all their guilty stains. It is all about the reset option. Would you be free from your burdens of sin? Would you over evil a victory win? Would you be free from passion and pride? There is power in the blood of Jesus to reset you, to change you, to revive you, to restructure you, to change you from the way you started and to the way God wants you to be. Family, I don't know how this journey to Christendom has started for you. I don't even know how your journey overall has started. I don't know, I don't need to know what your beginnings were like, but I do know this, that God wants to reset you for his kingdom. God wants to change your perspective for his kingdom. God wants to give you a refreshed mindset, a refreshed life for his kingdom. And all he's saying you got to do is open up so that he can come in and sup with you. So the message is simple today. The message is simple. You don't have to be the way you have been ever since you came into this world. You don't have to be the way the world has taught you to be ever since you came into this world, but you can be who God wants you to be. So here it is, my prayer is simple. My prayer is simple, Father in heaven, you are an awesome God, I'm done. You are merciful, you are great, you are everything we need. Father, help us not to kick against the pricks any longer, but help us to submit our will into your hands. Submit everything about us into your hands so that you can do what you do best there, God, and give us a new beginning. Through your son, Jesus Christ, I pray, amen and amen.